That's kind of interesting that without this one box, all the hard work that we have done so far was for nothing. What's up everyone, awesome to see you back. Today we are breaking down both of our establishment shots. This one and that one. We'll dive into 3D lighting, share some obscure tricks and sprinkle in some hidden compositional tips along the way. It's a pretty sweet lesson if you want to level up your technical game and improve your artistic eye a bit. Yeah, let's start with the Cacti project. This is how the final scene looks like. All the geometry is here. Everything is positioned to work within the camera view. And that's how we usually work, even in our commercial projects. But if we zoom out, you'll notice a lot of different, seemingly pointless things. But don't worry, it will make sense pretty soon. I'll go through the scene first and then we will jump into interactive, so you can see what each piece of the puzzle actually does. As you can see, the scene extends far into the background. We have some mountains in the far back. The reason for that is the aerial perspective because those distant mountains will fade away and create a natural sense of depth and space. When it comes to lighting, we use the native Corona Sun and Sky system. As you can see, we have the sun shining from the side and strongly from above. For context, this is where our action takes place. The settings are quite typical. We have the intensity set to 0.5 and the size to 1. Alongside Corona Sun, we have the Corona Sky, Intensity at 1, that's also pretty standard and perhaps one non-standard thing is increasing the altitude. It's actually a nice trick to increase the sky saturation. The idea is that the higher we are on Earth, the higher we are in mountains, the deeper and more saturated the color of the sky. That's just how it works, you know? So the next time you change the altitude, you at least know why that's the case. We also use the Corona volume effect. It's not full volumetrics, it's basically a slight color overlay. It works really fast and it's enough to make our aerial perspective real. In addition, we have a copy of Corona Sky. We keep the same settings, but add procedural clouds here. Eventually we plug it into Color Correct, and that goes to the direct visibility slot. Meaning one Corona Sky is used for illumination, and this one is directly visible in the rendering. The original one is usually a bit overexposed, so we lower the exposure and counter the hue to have a nice blue memory color of the sky. You'll see it in just a moment when we click render, but first a few more words about our scene. Next up we have those huge boxes, and they're kind of interesting. There's actually some hidden logic behind them, but I'll elaborate on it in the interactive mode. Another thing you might have also noticed are some cacti floating in the air. A few of them are actually visible in the final rendering, and they are there to frame the composition, but others are placed outside the shot. And the reason for that is just to cast shadows, just where we need them. So yeah, let's jump into interactive and see that in action. We are in the interactive right now. This is how our raw rendering looks like. Now let's start with hiding those boxes. Fast forward, boxes are no longer visible, but interestingly, the shadow is still here. The only change is that the shadow became a bit brighter. So fun fact, those boxes don't cast shadows, but they actually control how deep the shadows are. First of all, they block skylight coming from the back. That's obvious, you know, but they have another hidden feature as well. In the final scene, they had black material and the result looks like this. But if we change their material to super white, the foreground will look like this the shadow gets a bit brighter again. Not as bright as if there was no box at all, but still noticeably lighter. So yeah, what happens here is that those boxes, apart from blocking light, also reflect or absorb light coming from the front. You can see a comparison between two options. If the material is darker, we get deeper shadows. If the material is brighter, everything gets brighter. So if you think about it, material color becomes a tool to control foreground shadows. Pretty cool trick to know. Yeah, now moving on. Next up, I will hide some floating cacti one by one to show you what their purpose was. First of all, a few of them are here just to help with composition. They frame the corners of the image, but at the same time, they serve another, more subtle purpose. They actually enhance the sense of depth. When the viewer sees the same object both up close and far away, it becomes easier to read the scale of the whole scene. And because we've placed cacti at multiple distances, in the foreground, midground, and the background, that kind of repetition really helps to sell the depth of the image. And lastly, some of the cacti cast shadows in the foreground and all across the scene, 
Without them, the scene looks flooded with light, you know, and the overall perception shifts completely. It almost feels like we are in the middle of a dry, extremely hot land, and the air is really heavy. And to be honest, that's not what we are aiming for. We introduce those additional shadows, and personally, we like to have some depth and very strong contrast in the foreground. Beautiful, that's the final image. There's a bit of post-production on top, but we will dive into post-production two videos from now. That part leans into the AI side of things, and today we are keeping it 3D. So yeah, stay tuned, there's more to come, and with the lighting out of the way, let me show you some cool compositional tricks that we used here. We did a so-called compositional optimization, which might sound crazy, but let me break it down. In the final images, uh, all the objects are carefully placed. If we were to draw some guiding lines, we can see that they form those circular shapes, especially as we move upward in the frame. There's also like the center of gravity in this image, which is near the monster and the character. It's all kind of like a hidden geometry and it's incredibly powerful when your composition can be broken down to simple, clean shapes like that. And interestingly enough, that wasn't the case in the round one. You can see that colors and the lighting are literally the same, but in our opinion, those tiny geometrical adjustments make a huge difference. This is before and after before and after. So yeah, like compositional optimization. When we overlay the same lines onto draft one, you can clearly see they are there, but not quite there yet. And it was really about moving things left and right, testing, adjusting to find a perfect balance. Every image is different and it's like a puzzle you need to solve time after time. So yeah, that's something you can always keep in mind. And if you like to hear more ideas like this, especially around composition and color, be sure to check the 3D plus AI masterclass. In the final chapter, we cover the silk rope image. Uh, we are going literally from start to finish, composition, research, lighting, time lapses, like all that kind of stuff without skipping a single step. Beautiful, halfway through. Now let's break down the second image. And since we are on the topic of composition, let's start with some hidden compositional knowledge behind this image. So let's start with the so-called layout. And by that, I mean how interesting our 3D scene actually is. Are there different levels of terrain? Are there curvy roads, maybe some hills or dramatic elevation? Do we have any of that here? Um, well, no. All we have is essentially this. We have a box on the plane and in theory, this should be boring as hell. And when your 3D layout is as simple, it's actually way harder to make the image feel dynamic. So what can we do? We start thinking about the image more like a 2D poster. It becomes almost like a graphical composition where everything needs to be precise. So let me elaborate here. Take trees. This is the final image. And this is an additional rendering we did with less optimal trees. And as I toggle between them, you can immediately feel something is off. It's just too perfect. It's just too evenly placed. And this situation happens more than you might think. It can easily slip under your radar when you're focused on other parts of the image. That's why we place the trees at the forest edge and in the foreground manually. We don't use scatter for those. It's a small effort, but it gives so much more intentionality to your images. The other thing is the chapel. If we replace the chapel with something less distinctive, less graphical, it would look a bit less engaging as well. It looks borderline comical, like why there are so many priests heading into this tiny house. And if you're sloppy with placing the characters, the whole thing would fall apart as well. Like in this example, the geometry of them versus the chapel is so much more boring. We lose a lot of contrast in shapes, we lose a sense of movement, and on top of that, the depth of the scene is a little bit harder to read. And the last thing that makes this composition a little bit more interesting is adding water reflections and practical lights. If we take them out, the whole scene feels flat and lifeless. The same trick is used on movie sets, some reflections, a little bit of artificial lights. It instantly brings energy and depth into the frame. And it's something you can always reach for to elevate your images. Okay, so just to sum it up, this image is all about careful placement, object selection and cool design. We improve it one step at a time. And while skipping one of those aspects may seem like no big deal, 
But if you're careless in every area, the result ends up looking like this. Yep. Sometimes it takes a couple of hours moving things left and right. And sometimes it's like a perfect tree you need to select. And sure, it takes time and effort, but that's what it takes to make beautiful images. And when it finally clicks, totally worth it. Now moving on, let's break down the three lighting in this scene and give you some additional commentary. So yeah, this scene is built around the chapel, which is the main element. You can notice the water area surrounding the chapel. It has some vertex paint applied. White areas are normal water and black areas have a little bit of a different material, something like, uh, I don't know, dirty water or like a mud. And there's also about a million different scatterings here. Trees, shrubs, grasses. We used a forest pack for all of that, but we could use Corona scatter as well. If we zoom out a little bit, you'll notice some additional stuff. First, there's this transparent box. This box is used to block the light coming from behind the camera. The camera sits deep inside it, and this helps us to shape the light in the foreground. And apart from it, let me show it here, there's a big blue box as well. This is just a simple box with volumetric material applied. We are not using global volumetrics here. Now, let me show you how everything looks like in the interactive mode. Fast forward, we are in the interactive view. As you can see, this is the raw rendering and it's pretty close to the final image. We use PG Sky 1958 for the lighting setup, but you can use Corona Sky without the sun if you like. Actually, when it comes to the lighting scenario, it's those two boxes that we just saw and they are doing all the heavy lifting here. Let me hide the volumetric first. Here, yeah, actually we had two different volumetric boxes, but it's the same purpose. There was one in front and the other one in the far behind for greater control. And without them, the scene completely loses its character, you know? We cannot read the depth. We don't have those interesting trees and chapel silhouettes anymore. That's kind of interesting that without this one box, all the hard work that we have done so far was for nothing, you know? And now let's see how the scene looks like without the other box. And it also has a massive impact on the scene. We get much more lighting coming from the back right now. We again lose that geometrical relationship between the priest and the chapel. It's like super faded. It definitely disrupts our perception of the scene. So yeah, I want to bring both of those boxes back. That's the trick here, two boxes. Yeah, two boxes and a lot of geometrical consideration. Okay, slowly bring this lesson home. I hope you're still hanging in there. Before we wrap up, I want to share one last idea that shows up in both of those images. Ideally, your establishment shot should have some kind of conflict, or maybe you can even call it tension. We are naturally drawn to that tension. We love to guess how things might unfold. And in Panikida, that tension came from the mysterious ritual. When you look at an image like this, you start asking questions like, who are they? Uh, who's this lady? Is she going to be okay? The fact that we have something unresolved instantly makes your creative sandbox more intriguing. In Cacti, uh, for example, there's a clean master and slave dynamic. You can feel the tension between the protagonist and the antagonist right away. And on top of that, uh, it's nice to have some sort of mini stories as well. Each of those images are based on our establishment shot. We created them using the same scene and none of them would have worked without those mini stories feeding into the bigger story. There's like added tension between the monks and the protagonist. Everyone is staring at him. One of them kicks him. Now imagine replacing all of that with a single character in a generic pose. You suddenly lose all that story and all that energy and there's just nothing to work with, you know? It might seem like a small thing, but always keep an eye on the tension in your images, especially when you are doing creative sandboxes. It's a great mental shortcut to check if your scene actually has something going on. So yeah, that's all for today. In the next video, we'll create additional lighting scenarios, pretty nice and chill and full of tricks. Thanks for watching and see you in the next one.